So this weekend you're going to hear a lot of great stories from innovators, <coughs> folks from business, folks from the military who have done great things. I'm not here to talk about that. I'm not that guy. What I'm here to do today is to tell you a little story, to give you some history, to help you realize that a lot of the things we're talking about this weekend are not necessarily that new. This is Vice Admiral William Souden Sims. Now, obviously, William Sims wasn't always a Vice Admiral. And in 1900, he was a lieutenant who was finishing up staff duty in Europe. He had orders to join the USS Kentucky on China Station, the Navy's newest and most powerful battleship. He had spent the last couple of years studying the battleships of Europe, as well as the gunnery practices of both our potential allies and our potential adversaries. So he joined USS Kentucky, checked on board, and started looking around. And he realized that while it was the most, or the newest, it might not be the most powerful battleship going. There were several real problems with this ship. A few examples were that the gun ports were large, so that you could easily move the guns, but they also weren't armored very well, so penetration was easy. The gun decks were also pretty low to the waterline, so if she took a moderate to heavy sea, water would pour into the gun decks. And finally, there was no real separation between the gun decks and the magazines below, so an enemy shell could penetrate directly to the magazine with catastrophic effect. Sims was incensed, and he started putting together a list of the deficiencies and writing a report. And he wrote a letter to a friend and fellow officer, and he said, the Kentucky is not a battleship at all. She is the worst crime in naval construction ever perpetrated by the white race. So, yes. <laughs> Now, Sims realized that he couldn't really change the ship and the design of the ship while he was on deployment. And so he started standing his bridge watches and he started looking for another way to make the ship better. And he focused on the things that today we call tactics, techniques, and procedures, or TTPs. So it was while sailing through the South China Sea and visiting the ports of southern China that he met a man from the British Royal Navy who would serve as an inspiration. Percy Scott was a captain in 1900 and 1901, and he was the commanding officer of the HMS Terrible. Now, Scott was a little bit of a pariah. He wasn't really known for getting along all that well with his peers or with his superiors. And later on in his career, he'd have a pretty significant feud with a senior admiral in the Royal Navy. So out on China Station, he was about as far from England as he could get. But on Terrible and on his previous ship, he was working on something he called continuous aim fire. And it was something that he thought would revolutionize naval warfare. But even as a captain, he couldn't get anyone to pay attention and realize it was important. So let's talk about gunnery for a second. Gunnery hadn't really changed in 1900 or 1901 much since USS Constitution faced down the British frigates in the War of 1812. The gunnery, the director of the gun, would estimate the distance to the enemy ship. And then he'd set the elevation of the gun. And then he'd have to time the roll of the ship to fire to try and hit the enemy. Now this is why most decisive sea engagements in the age of sail occurred at very, very close range. It was neither a very rapid nor a very accurate way to engage the enemy. So on board HMS Terrible, Percy Scott re-engineered the elevation gear on the guns. And he installed telescopic sights. Now this did two things. It allowed the gun director to continually move the barrel of the weapon as the ship rolled. And the telescopic sight allowed the gun director to keep the barrel pointed at the enemy continuously. This meant that a gun crew could now shoot as fast as they could reload. Now, Sims watched the terrible conduct gunnery practice, and he realized this could change everything in naval warfare. A ship that used continuous aim fire might be able to take on an entire squadron of ships that wasn't using it. So he wrote a report, and he sent it to the Bureau of Ordnance in Washington, D.C. Sims befriended Scott, and he learned how the Brits were pulling this off. He set about figuring out how to re-gear the American guns 
in teaching American gun crews exactly how to conduct continuous aim fire evolutions. It wasn't long before he had a couple of crews, American crews, that were performing nearly as well as the Terribles were. So he sat down and he wrote a detailed report. This is how you change the American gun gear. This is how you teach the gun crews how to do this. And he sent the report to the Bureau. And he waited for a response. And he waited. And he waited. He heard nothing. Now the Bureau of Ordnance at the Washington Navy Yard received these reports. And the experts read through them. But the claims of accuracy increase made by this lieutenant out on China Station, they were simply outlandish. There was no way. So the reports were filed in a file cabinet in the basement of the Ordnance Building. And they were forgotten about. See, the Bureau of Ordnance are the ones who had designed the guns that were on American battleships. They're the ones who had set up the procedures for how they would be used. And everybody knows that American hardware and American sailors are the best in the world, right? No one even asked the question, what if this lieutenant is right? So let's talk about psychology here for a second. Dr. Angela Duckworth and a team of researchers at UPenn for the past decade or so have been studying innovators and competitors, trying to figure out what makes success happen. And one of the things that they've determined is one of the greatest indicators for future success is a never give up attitude. And they've labeled this trait grit. So in a recent study, they took grit and they compared it to openness to new experience. And obviously innovation, right? New experience. It's all about new experience. It's about the idea. But what they've discovered is when it comes to actual success in the introduction of a new innovation, it's the competition between the innovator and the forces of the status quo that is actually a greater indicator of success. Grit matters more. So whether we're talking about Stephen King sending his manuscript for Carrie to 30 publishers before someone decided that they would print it and have a runaway bestseller on their hands, or we're talking about Colonel Sanders himself taking his fried chicken recipe to a thousand restaurants before anyone would pay him to use it, it's that never give up, never say die attitude that gets innovators or creative people to success. So William Sims continued working on continuous aim fire. He kept writing reports. He constantly worked with his gun crews and his war mates to improve the process, make it more efficient, learn better ways to teach people how to do this, make the gun elevation gear work better. He kept sending the reports, and he still heard nothing. He kind of knew what was happening. He was just a lieutenant. He had never served on the Bureau of Ordnance staff. He wasn't one of their known experts. So he wrote a letter to a friend in which he said, with every fiber of my being, I loathe indirection and shiftiness. And when it occurs in high place and is used to save face at the expense of the vital interests of our great service, in which silly people put such childlike trust, I want that man's blood and I'll have it no matter what it costs me personally. Now, Sims respected rank, but it obviously, by itself, did not impress him. He really didn't have any interest in officers who were putting together the next foot rep bullet or protecting the bureaucracy. Instead, he was interested in the combat effectiveness of forces at sea. Obviously, he felt pretty strongly about it. I'd say that William Sims had true grit. He continued writing his reports. This time his language started to get more dramatic. He started to talk about what happens if the Navy doesn't use continuous aim fire and someone else does. What happens when we start losing naval battles in huge numbers? He also started sending the letters and the reports, not just to the Bureau of Ordnance, but to battleship captains all over the fleet, all over the world so that they could read what he was working on. 
and he got his commanding officer, as well as the admiral in charge of Asiatic Squadron, to write endorsement letters to go on the front of these reports. They'd seen continuous aim fire at work. They knew how important it could be. So word started to spread. And the Bureau of Ordnance realized they kind of needed to do something. They were getting letters and messages written back to them in Washington, D.C. from these battleship captains all over the world wanting to know, what's the deal with this continuous aim fire thing? So they developed a test. They developed the test in order to prove that continuous aim fire didn't work. And they succeeded. They conducted their test. They wrote their report, and in it they said that what Lieutenant Sims claimed was a, quote, mathematical impossibility. <laughs> now, the test that they conducted, they didn't change the gearing on the guns like Sims required. And they conducted the test on dry land for a procedure for a ship rolling at sea. The physics doesn't work. But they were the Bureau of Ordnance, and they had an official report, and they submitted it, and they sent message traffic throughout the fleet saying, this doesn't work, Sims is wrong. And belief in Sims evaporated overnight. In the span of two years, Sims wrote 13 reports. And when the Bureau of Ordnance said, what you've been accomplishing is impossible, he finally had enough. He did something that later on in his life, he would admit, was the rankest kind of insubordination. Sims wrote a letter directly to the President of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> President Theodore Roosevelt, who had once been Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt, was a navalist by the very definition of the word. At age 24, directly out of Yale, the man wrote The Naval War of 1812 a seminal history book that to this day is still considered the standard text of that war. He was personal friends with Alfred Thayer Mahan, the great naval historian and strategist. And he'd go on to deploy the great white fleet around the world. So the president, as they sometimes did more than a century ago, actually read the letter from the lieutenant on China Station. And being a navalist, he knew that if what Sims claimed was true, it was hugely important. So President Roosevelt ordered a test be conducted, an exercise, to prove the state of existing American naval skill. Five ships were sent out to sea from the Atlantic Fleet, and they were given an old light ship to shoot at. Each ship was given five minutes to fire at a distance of about three quarters of a mile. The results were worse than anyone could have possibly imagined. In 25 minutes of straight shooting at this target, two shells went through the sail of the light ship. None of them hit the ship itself after 25 minutes. Roosevelt immediately ordered William Sims to return from China Station. And in his bluster at the White House, he's reported as saying, Give him entire charge of target practice for 18 months. Do exactly as he says. <laughs> if he does not accomplish anything in that time, cut off his head and try someone else. <laughs> William Sims came home from China Station, and he assumed the responsibilities of the U.S. Navy's inspector of target practice. He was given a small staff, two junior lieutenants. Three lieutenants. Change the world. No sweat. He started out by circulating his reports throughout the fleet to the captains and the gunnery officers. He wanted them to read it. He instituted mandatory training. See, there had been no required gunnery practice of any kind. Each captain got to decide what he wanted to do. So Sims made mandatory gunnery practice a requirement. He did not make continuous aim fire required. Instead, he just sent out the reports for everyone to read. They were welcome to start with his idea. He traveled throughout the fleet, and he briefed war rooms, and he trained gun crews on how to do it. He instituted an annual gunnery competition. Every ship in the fleet would fight. Every ship would shoot. 
Continuous aim fire was not required. The winner would have their names in the newspapers. They'd be announced throughout the fleet. The gunnery officer on the winning ship, however, was required to write a report and tell everybody how he did it, how he won. So every year, the gunnery officers throughout the fleet would pour over the report from the year before. And then as they built up the reports from the years before that, they would sit with their war room mates and their gun crews and they'd try and figure out more efficient ways to do this. How do we shoot faster? How do we shoot more accurately? They would write their own reports. They'd write articles for the Naval Institute's place for disruptive thinking, a journal called Proceedings. The winner would get a pen that they could hang from their yard arm. It had a big E emblazoned on it. This was the birth of the contest that today is called the Battle E. And today, ships and squadrons still compete with each other every single year to be the winners of the Battle E. Demand in the fleet for now Lieutenant Commander William Sims and his two assistants was insatiable. They were invited to come to ships all the time. So what you see here is an invitation to the gun doctor and his two assistants, Ping and Pong, to join the war room of the USS Missouri for a silent dinner. So a silent dinner is kind of like a mess night or a dining in with rules like Vegas. What's talked about at the silent dinner stays at the silent dinner. And on nights like these, Sims would lead the insurgent spirit in the Navy. Over cigars and port wine at the end of the night, he would tell stories of besting the Navy's bureaucracy and inspire JOs to follow their own innovative instincts. At the end of the Sims Gunnery Revolution, a winning gun crew on a winning ship had 15 hits in one minute. They were firing at the same distance as Roosevelt's test. Half of their hits were in the bullseye. So the U.S. Navy, over the course of a few years, overtook the Royal Navy as the best gunners in the world. Even the Royal Navy now admitted that that great revolutionary, their own Percy Scott, had kind of been on to something all along. And they started adopting continuous aim fire as well. Even Admiral Newton Mason, the chief of the Bureau of Ordnance, was forced to admit the Renaissance in gunnery, which came about chiefly through the instrumentality of Commander Sims, has led to great improvements in ordnance. Kind of an understatement, but at least he said it. In the fleet, Lieutenant Commander William Sims became known as the man who taught us how to shoot. So what are some of the lessons that we can observe for the innovator from some of this history? First, you need to know where your expertise lies. William Sims spent years studying battleships and gunnery procedures before he joined Kentucky. You need to study, you need to do the deep research needed to understand why things are the way they are. In order to change them, you need to have that foundation. You need to know that you don't know everything. You need to set about learning as much as you can. And you need to become the expert in whatever the subject is that you're working on. Second, you need to find a way to talk about your idea or your innovation. Now, take Sims' advice and don't be insubordinate about it, okay? Probably shouldn't write a letter to the president either. I don't think it's going to get you very far. <laughs> However, you need to figure out how to work both inside the lifelines and outside the lifelines. So inside the lifelines, in the bureaucracy, we have ways to make things better. You can write submissions to improve TTPs and send them up the chain of command. You can write manual changes and submit them to the model managers or whoever controls the documents. You can write white papers and you can send them up your chain of command. Working inside the system is important and it matters. You also have to be able to work outside the lifeline. You need to be able to write an article, put it on paper, have it be good, and send it to a place like USNI's Proceedings or Armed Forces Mail, 
meant that unlike during the age of sail, junior officers could now send letters to each other. They could get from Washington, D.C. to China Station and back again relatively quickly. And so these JOs would write letters, they'd share ideas with each other, they'd give each other support, they'd pass intelligence that they had figured out to each other all over the world. Some of these people were men like Bradley Fisk. Now in the 1890s, Bradley Fisk was a lieutenant and he had invented the telescopic sight for a heavy gun that Percy Scott and William Sims would use in their continuous aim fire. He wrote an untold number of articles for proceedings. He was incredibly prolific. He had more patents than any line officer in the US Navy. And he wrote these articles to proceedings to support Sims' movement, but also for his own ideas and his own innovations. Later on in his career, as he became more senior, he became critical to the Navy establishing the office of the Chief of Naval Operations and actually having the administrative innovation of introducing a general staff. And then when he was very senior, he was one of the first proponents of this new thing called naval aviation when he helped develop the tactics, techniques, and procedures for aerial bombardment of ships and aerial torpedo attacks. Then there's Ridley McLean. Ridley McLean served with Sims on China Station, and he got called back with him to be his assistant in the gunnery office. So in the office, it was actually McLean who wrote the gunnery manual. It was his job to take Sims' ideas and this massive stack of reports and turn it into a useful manual for the fleet. He also wrote something called the Blue Jackets Manual. It was the very first written manual for enlisted men, and it is still published to this day, obviously updated, and issued to sailors of boot camp. Now, McLean would go on to command a battleship in World War I, and then after that, he became one of the very first commanders of the U.S. Navy submarine force, and one of the very first advocates of this disruptive new weapon trying to advance its future in the Navy and naval warfare. And a final example is Philip Alger. Alger was one of Sims' classmates at the Naval Academy, but after his initial commitment was over, he got out of the Navy, and he went back to Annapolis and became an instructor and professor of gunnery and ordnance. Philip Alger was a consultant who was regularly called in by the Bureau of Ordnance to help them go over new material. So Philip Alger started writing letters back to William Sims on China Station, sharing with him the deliberations inside the Bureau of Ordnance. He shared with him who was against him and fighting him. He shared with him who was maybe not supporting him, but at least interested in the new ideas. When Sims came home, he and Alger would work together on articles. They'd write them together about continuous aim fire and how it worked and how to make it more efficient. And then Alger would publish them under his own name, trying to take the heat off of Sims when the superiors came ahead on him. So, innovation in the military. It needs junior leaders with experience, expertise, and grit. It needs senior officers who are willing to take the chance that when they see an interesting new idea that they're going to support it, even if sometimes it might seem that they're bordering on the insubordinate, or as General Mattis once said, they look like a bag of muck. It also requires peers, a network of friends and staff officers all over the world to help each other and support each other to get these innovations through the bureaucracy. Sims embodied all these things as he went through his career. Back to Vice Admiral Sims again. When he arrived in England, when the U.S. entered World War I, a group of J.O.s came to him with this new idea. See, they were lieutenants who were the commanding officers of a new type of ship called the Destroyer. And they thought that they could convoy ships across the Atlantic. See, the supply lines were under daily attack, and England was on the verge of starvation. Nothing could get through. But the Admiralty had refused to adopt these new tactics. So Sims went to the Admiralty, and he said, if I bring more destroyers over from the US and we help you with this, 
I want your buy-in, and we'll do this together, we'll convoy the ships. And they agreed. And almost overnight, the convoys worked. Sims wrote back to Washington, D.C. Now, remember, this is the guy who studied battleships his entire career, had been the CEO of battleships. He wrote back to D.C. and said, stop building battleships. Put all of the effort into destroyers. We need to win the Battle of the Atlantic. Sims would go on after the war to be the president of the Naval War College, and he started these war games to try and test out new ideas. One of the new ideas that they figured out was that naval aviation was a key to the future of warfare. In fact, it caused him in the early 1920s to write to his buddy Bradley Fisk and say, quote, the battleship is dead. So, there's a reason that my slides earlier said lessons observed instead of lessons learned. These are observations that I've pulled from this history. We know from Sim's example that we need junior leaders with expertise, with grit, senior leaders who will support them and help innovative ideas get through the bureaucracy, and peers and groups of supporters to help make these things happen. So whether or not these lessons observed become lessons learned, that's up to all of you guys. Thank you very much. Any questions for BJ? <laughs> Sir, about how long from that initial kind of discovery of continuous empire did it take before he was finally in a position to get uh, a broader fleet So, So it was from his arrival with Kentucky on China Station to the sending of the letter, if you will, about two years, a little bit more than two years. Um, the thing that I take away and I have to realize here is that you got to remember, <clears throat> this wasn't Sim's idea. Right? This was Percy Scott's idea. Now, he made it better. He made it usable. He made it functional. He's the one who pushed it through the bureaucracy. But I think it's an important lesson for all of us in that idea of looking around and helping each other out. Because it might not be your idea, but you may be able to help someone's idea. And then, guess what? You kind of get credit for it. So just to follow up, so two years, and then he gets the chance to start with President Roosevelt's support, he gets the chance right. to start working through the issues. So then, by the time we've got fleets competing and the standards of gunnery actually improving is six years? He was in the job for six years. Okay. Significant improvement seen probably within two years of him taking the job. So, okay, so four, four years, basically. Looking at, I mean, this is a story about the earliest part of the 20th century. Um, so, I mean, my background, I'm in marine aviation, uh, Sproul brought me out here. I'll be talking on panel tomorrow. Long time guys in Silicon Valley. Who's asking the second order question? Here we are, a hundred years later. We go into Afghanistan in 2001. We have a counterinsurgency manual published in 2007. Six years. Here we've got new innovations on the battleship line a hundred years ago, and it takes four years to get them into broader practice. Where, where's the second order conversation right now around uh, whether a compliance-oriented bureaucracy kind of works at this pace over a hundred year time scale um, makes sense in, uh, in this context. I mean, the bureaucracy is a specific technology embedded to do a specific thing, uh, get rid of tribalism and nepotism, right? And it's done that very well. Um, but kind of, it, it's the, the meta question seems a little concerning. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is the conversation. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I think that's why we're all here. I think that's why we all want to talk about these things. I also think it's why history lessons like this are important. Because if we think the things we're experiencing today are revolutionary and new, you're going to miss lessons that will keep you from making mistakes. You're going to miss good ideas if you don't go back and look at what other people have done before. That's the what if here. Going back to uh, Lieutenant Sims, if they were in the midst of an actual naval gunfight, 
when he was proposing these ideas, would he have had a different audience? In other words, would they have been more, in other words, because there was no threat, and so therefore there was no imminent danger, would he have had, well, first of all, would he have approached it differently, and would he have been accepted differently? And I ask that to say, do you have to couch for innovation to really take hold quickly? Do you have to couch it against an imminent or in-your-face threat? Or is it one of those things where, as Hitchens was talking about, I want to be a disruptive guy, it's going to be painful, and I must carry a thousand pounds on my back. You know, so how do you feel from your read of the history because of there was no imminent threat, how Sims approached this versus if there was one? So Sims was doing this with basically Decade, decade and a half before World War One. Right. Right. There was a naval arms race starting in the world at about this time. Um, so this is this. I mean, it's hard to draw parallels here, but this is not today. Okay. This is not. Hmm, maybe there's someone rising to be a peer competitor somewhere. Okay. There's more of a correlation probably with the Cold War of look. There are these navies on the world's oceans that we are probably going to have to fight soon. Um, so the idea that this was peacetime, it was no big deal, don't know that that's necessarily an accurate way to look at the history. But you're right, no one was shooting at each other yet. Okay? Um, and I think that's a valid observation. You know, In times of conflict, when people are dying, I think we, probably he would have had ears that were open quicker. But there's also another element to this. Okay, It takes a while to train an entire Navy on how to do something. I know we all think that this should be quick because we can go sit down at our computer-based trainer today. But back then, it takes a long time to train every gunner in the fleet on how to do this and to get all the parts to the ships to change every gun in the fleet to re-gear it. So, I mean, there is that large organization element to this, too. What Could you comment on the role that the, the games essentially played in putting forth this innovative idea, not necessarily requiring it, but setting up a competition where what the performance metric of being able to hit a target at that distance what role that played in him actually getting this into the fleet. And I think that's a really important point. right? He didn't make anything mandatory. You could have a good idea too. And if your good idea was better than his, and you won, you got to tell everybody about it. And you got credit for it because your captain got to put that E pennant on the yard on So I think there's an important point to be had there. What was the metric of success? The metric of success was hitting the target, right? The metric of success was not the closest compliance to the procedures as laid out in the manual, written by Ridley McLean, as based on Williamson's reports. No, it was hitting the target. That was the metric of success. And I do think that's an important point. I also think that it is, it is a, an important thing to raise this idea that by, by introducing continuous aim fire the way he did, he was able to get buy-in, for lack of a better phrase, from the entire fleet. He was able to get everybody interested in doing this stuff. And cult of personality, okay, he traveled, like we saw with the invitation to Missouri, he traveled the entire fleet. Everybody knew who Sims was. And everybody knew that when he came to the ship, you were going to hear some good stories, and you were going to learn some stuff. And I'm getting the uh, I'm getting the, the one last question here, so I think you got your hand up the longest. Oh, thanks. Uh, actually, I wanted to help answer a question, the preceding one about um, did you actually be able to shoot more and, and try to put a couple of examples around it? Because I think there's actually uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a long line of literature actually that suggests that is it necessary that gosh it really helps? I mean, Germany's got a pretty vicious stack down in 18 and you know by 19.
so there is that aspect to things. Um, I do warn you, though, that as, as you were saying, if it takes you six years to write a counterinsurgency manual, while you've got an insurgency, a hot one brewing, you probably should worry about what's going to happen in the next decade when intelligence. I guess that's why I'm here. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for your attention. side to talk about the sponsorship of USNI, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Sam Legrone, who's one of their primary journalists. So, Sam, over Hi. to you. This is great. It's like the price is right. One dollar, Sam. Yeah, one dollar. Whatever. Alright, so it's just a little basic report. Alright. Alright, so... Okay, great. All right, so my name is Sam Legrone. I am the uh, online editor for the U.S. Naval Institute, uh, which is something new for us, um, which we've been doing for probably at the last year and a half. I'm a former uh, Jane's uh, reporter. I was a U.S. Maritime correspondent for Jane's Defense Weekly for about two and a half years, and I've been working defense issues as a working reporter since 2005. So I came to the Naval Institute in 2012, uh, February 2012. And the reason I came there was because of this mission statement, which is great, if you think about it. I mean, if you get past sort of the 1890s kind of, um, you know, sort of uh, way of speaking and these annoying Oxford comments, it actually says a lot. It's really, it's really interesting. Okay, independent forum, um, which is what the Naval Institute's all about. We've established an organization for people to go without uh, fear of having their ideas squashed down in a military hierarchy, we've created a, another place for people to have these discussions about uh, sea power. And my favorite line was, for those who dare, because whenever you write something, whenever you think you put your ideas out there, you're kind of taking a risk, right? And I think that kind of fits in with a lot of the ideas that are here at the Entrepreneurist Forum, those, those, that daring. It's very um, important to, to, to what we are, because, um, just a little bit about the Naval Institute. We're not an advocacy organization. We're not like AUSA or the Navy League. We don't have a legislative agenda. We don't lobby Congress. We aren't in favor of specific platforms over other specific platforms. Only thing we want is your ideas. So you can go and discuss them and, and get people talking and thinking. That's essentially, you know, it's, it's we make the boxing ring and you guys jump in and do the fighting. That's kind of how we like thinking about business. And this is how we try to get the word out there. So we've got proceedings. Uh, which has been around since 1874. We just celebrated our uh, 140th anniversary. Um, and this has been our primary uh, way of talking to people. It's a monthly magazine. Uh, BJ's on the editorial board. It's a peer-reviewed journal. Um, we've got Naval History, uh, which is a really just fantastic magazine on Naval History. I mean, it's, it's better than anything else. And uh, we have a, you know, the US and I blog, uh, which has been around for a few years now. And, uh, that's a good place to tell, like, sort of personal stories. Um, and then uh, we also have a, a pretty extensive archive. Uh, we've got oral histories. Navy doesn't have its own oral history program, so we decided as an organization to pick up the slack. We've been doing it for years, and we've got guys like Jimmy Doolittle and Arlie Burke and Chester Nimitz. Um, and we also have a really great uh, photo collection of about 450,000 photos, which is, uh, which is great. Um, we also have the Naval Institute Press. Um, you know, most famous for Hunt for the Red October, um, Fly the Intruder, those are two novels that we've written, but we also do uh, combat fleets, um, you know, and uh, uh, Claude Ruby did the Aiden Effect, which is a new novel, and then, you know, uh, Circle of Treason, which is actually made into a miniseries and a movie, which we're pretty excited about. But the idea is, is you know, it's an academic press talking a lot about, like, the issues that, um, you know, that, that are relevant for the sea services in, in addition to publishing the Blue Jackets manual and a couple other things. Um, and this is what I do for the Naval Institute. So um, back about two years ago, the leadership decided that uh, it would be a good idea to have kind of a daily news service to kind of fill in the gaps between proceedings. Because like, even if you're, even if you're hustling uh, with proceedings, it can take some time to get something into the magazine. Um, so uh, this is an example of what we did in uh, pretty quickly, 